Hello, I'm Denise Reiner, Director and Curator of OR Gallery. Today's conversation between Michelle Marie Latelier and Paz Guevara offers some insight into their research and exhibition and kicks off this conversation series guest curated by Paz Guevara and developed with artist Michelle Marie Latelier and OR Gallery. The series Poetics of a Sovereign Ocean, Orality, Reciprocity and Geopolitical Trajectories, 2021, features conversations with Michelle Marie Letelier, Paz Guevara, Morgan Guren, James Harry, David Alday, and Ande Sombi, and will be accessible from our website. These conversations are in connection with the exhibition, Am I Ancient or Human-Made Machine, which is on view at OR Gallery from August 28th through October 2nd. The conversations will continue to be accessible on our website, orgallery.org. There are many people to thank, but at this point, I would like to mention in particular, Yuta Brendemul and the Goethe Institute in Toronto for their support of this project. As well, I would like to thank the Blue Cabin Residency for their support of Michelle Marie's work and by extension, this project. Before we start the conversation in earnest, I would like to acknowledge that I myself and OR Gallery are located in so-called Vancouver, Canada, which is comprised of the still unceded territory of the Musqueam, Squamish and Tsleil-Waututh First Nations. I would further like to acknowledge that as we record this, many of us reaffirm our solidarity with the First Nations and our shame at the terrible legacy of the residential school system and what was done in the name of this country, where I currently live and work, Canada. Every child matters. Please view each video description for appropriate links and information and bios. Thank you very much. We are uh, Ampas Kibara and we are at Michel Marie Letelier studio in Berlin in the first conversation of the exhibition I'm Asian or a Human Mate. Here we would like to question how exhibitions have the capacity to create moments of communality rather than objectifying the beings that enter into the modern grid of the exhibition. How does the exhibition become permeable instead to life through orality, reciprocity, and in connection with geopolitical trajectories, struggles, and potential alliances. In a partly a speculative and in partly documentary manner, my dear uh, artist and friend, Michelle Margaret Aguirre, has been composing her work, weaving a series of collaborations through virtual reality, song, crystal performances, conversations like this one, and in situ actions, a method we are interested to bring into the exhibition to the front, to understand it as a process and community, rather than as an object or a result. Against the grain of extractivism, this exhibition engages them with the poetics of a sovereign ocean through the consciousness and memory of one of our fellow beings the Salmon, who says, I'm ancient or a human made. We would like to start with this triangle that unfolds a triangulation of entities and how uh, Michel Marie uh, will start uh, to introduce us through storytelling from existence, uh, from entities into the geopolitical uh, struggles between Norway, Canada and the South of Chile. Thank you, Paz. So as you see, this is going to be, imagine you're in a map and uh, you're looking up the north. So the compass will help you to visualize the north, the south, the west, and the east. And why is it triangle? Because as Paz will explain, this is a, an attempt or an invitation to understand a triangulation between Norway, Canada, and Chile, in this case, in terms of uh, an entity that has a deep, um, complex memory in the Northern Hemisphere, but in the Southern Hemisphere is seen as an enemy, as an invasor, as a neo-colonial tool. So um, I want to invite you to put in dialogue this, to understand the South and the North in terms of 
invention, but also in terms of memory and um, geological strata. So um, yeah, let's start. Would you like to start the um, uh, oral draft story that could depart from some of the entities that you selected from the triangle and then how uh, these entities would allow us to, to connect, to establish this bonding between places that seem to be disconnected, but share histories and struggles. And we hope that they could share also uh, future alliances. Let's start, I would say, I would suggest let's start from Norway because this project started actually from an original invitation to to develop an artwork in 10 days in constellating around the ocean. But then I found out that the main producers in the world of salmon are Norway and Chile. And that was a starting point. So I would suggest let's start with Norway. And this is representing Norway. And why the bones? Because I started to work with bones as a link of the calcification of a, a being or a, the calcification of our ancestors in the geological strata, thinking also of natural resources in terms of my previous practice, working with copper and saltpeter and coal. So it's, it's my practice has always been embedded with the research on minerals and the bone is a mineral. So this is the link. So um, then for me, it was super important to work with bones. And so I started to work with paleontologists in, in Norway, in Bergen, trying to preserve the bones of a supermarket salmon. And uh, it was a it, it was a challenge for all of us and uh, for them because they're not used to preserving supermarkets uh, species or animals and also these animals has uh, have been modified in order to have more fat more omega-3 in their bodies and that means in terms of preservation for paleontologists it's, it's kind of like a nightmare because they have to get rid of all the oil in order to get only the bone. And that's why you are looking at these bones yellowish because of the fat of the, of the salmon. So, um, and this also, of course, is part uh, other ideas, um, um, a virtual reality, for example, called the bone. And yeah, other thinking or other thinking in terms of how the bone is something that is um, reminding us of the memory of not only the salmon as a key species, but also uh, the salmon as, a, as, a, as our ancestor. Yeah. And then we could continue. Where, where do you want to continue? Us? Maybe we could go beyond of the structures of the nation state and uh, start also entering in the in indigenous communities that you engage with to enter uh, in the existence not of the farm sun, salmon that is genetically modified, but the wild salmon and the, the relation with ancestry and the relations of reciprocity that are quite different than the relations of extractivism and profit in which the farm salmon is uh, located, situated. Exactly. So we're still in Norway here. So one of the things that call my attention is how salmon is perceived and is um, part of a rich rituality in the Sami cultures in not, not, not only Norway, but Samis are also in, in Sweden, in Finland, in Russia, parts of, parts of Russia. 
So um, I first met Anderson, Anderson B in Tromso 2019, and I wanted to understand their relationship with someone and in terms of ritual, rituals, but also in terms of poetry. And then I discovered this yoik. What is a yoik? Yoik is a sacred chant that they have. Everybody, everything has a yoik, water, wind, animals, birds, people. And for example, you have a yoik, it's like your name. You can't sing your own yoik. Like the, but the others have to sing it for you. It's a sign of recognition. So I had this idea of what if we, what if I can commission a yoik for the salmon that is the protagonist of this work, the bone? Um, is it possible for me to commission a yoik or it's not possible? So I first asked Ande this question, and then he said, he's also a yoik singer. So then he said, yes, you, you can commission a yoik. Let's, let's make a yoik dedicated, especially for this salmon. And this salmon is actually existed. This salmon is, I can't, this is a representation of uh, uh, the bone of salmon in general, but in case of the bone, the virtual reality, it was all about a skull that I found, that I was uh, shown uh, within the, the, my work with the paleontologists. And all I know about this salmon is that it was a male salmon that died in the 60s. Um, it was a, a, a young adult. So with that information, we will record the yoik in uh, September 5th now in, in the Lofoten Mountains with Ander Sondi. So all this relationship that uh, I've had with him as a member of the Sami culture uh, has sparked also uh, a, a thinking of how not only Sami cultures, but cultures in the Northern Hemisphere, how they relate with these ancestral species. Um, and that is why for me, it's very important to work uh, not only in, in Norway, but also the complexities that, uh, that uh, British Columbia has. And that is why this triangle, because uh, someone is not only important in, in the Northern Hemisphere, I mean, in, in the Sami cultures, but also in, in other cultures in the Americas, but in the North. And in, in, const, in contrast with uh, our home country, Chile, in the south of Chile, the Yangan community had been uh, developing a struggle against the farm uh, salmon. So there becomes very relevant and political uh, the question that you pose in the virtual reality and that we use also as a title of the exhibition if uh, I'm an ancient or a human-made being, so how this consciousness of one being, the salmon, could ask uh, he or herself if he was uh, manipulated, intervene uh, or not. You told me that many of the farm salmon escaped from, from the nets and they became uh, very dangerous species in the south of Chile, where the Yalan community and this is one of the main problems that you confronted in your research. Well, the first problem I, confirmed, I confronted, and that was the problem that provoked my long-term research and, and compromise with, with this project, was the disaster in Chiloé, first of all. This, there was a disaster, there, was, there has been many crises in the salmon industry in Chile because of the neo neoliberal policies. There's no uh, regulations as in Norway how to produce salmon. So it's like maximum profit, low pay, uh, many, many more salmon in a net, many more vaccines, many more uh, antibiotics that are in, allowed in Norway, for example, for instance. So, 
and there has been therefore a lot of crisis uh, meaning uh, uh, dead salmons tons of tons of dead salmons in the coast in, of, of Chiloé and nowadays Chiloé as an island is completely contaminated depleted the 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 coasts are depleted and that's that is why they are looking for other places to put uh, 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 more salmon farms and it's also i think it's related with the global warming because as, as the planet is warming up uh, uh, you have to go to the poles to find the temperatures the optimal temperatures the salmon need so um, that's why they're they're fine. They're trying to install more salmon farms, more south in the south of Chile, south of Patagonia, where uh, Tierra del Fuego is, where the uh, Beagle can, can, Channel is, where all the uh, many um, national parks protected uh, by the by the state belonging to not only Yagan communities, but also Kaweshka communities, uh, they're threatened by the installment of this, uh, the summer farms and not protected at all. This is like a contradiction. It's, it's, it's supposed to be protected, but they are allowing summer farms projects to be installed right there. So that is why they are resisting because it's all at the, at the moment, it's all, it's all a speculation. It's not only it's, it's not an installment yet, and that is why this topic is very hot at the moment because there's still there's still time to stop this, as they did in Argentina like a month ago. They they did an, a historical law that uh, prohibited salmon farms in Tierra del Fuego in the south of uh, in, in in Argentina side, and this was a uh, this was a unprecedented. It was an historical law that is given the example not only to Argentina but also in, in the in the whole planet uh, a, prohib a legal provision to make uh, uh, some of farms so that is that is why for me it's interesting this constellation that is actually appearing in in Canada constellation between scientists politicians activists artists poets and uh, indigenous communities members there is all a constellation that is very sophisticated in, in, in the case of Canada and uh, is happening also in Chile and Argentina in regards to the resistance or, or against the Samo farming. Perhaps it's a good uh, a moment also to, to tell the story of the confrontation when one member of the royalty uh, of Norway visited the south of Chile and uh, triggered the strike and protest from the Yogan indigenous community exactly regarding the, the farm salmon. So this picture was taken in March 2019. Uh, the royal couple from Norway visited Chile and especially Punta Arenas and Puerto Williams in uh, in the Beagle Channel to lobby, to promote and lobby the uh, salmon industry, the original salmon industry in Chile. And they didn't know that they would find a lot of resistance against the salmon farming. So they hear, they, you know, they, they try to understand what does it mean, all these uh, signs and demonstrations against the salmon farming. After they went to the Punta Arenas, they went to Puerto Williams and they encountered uh, the Yagan community, not only the Yagan community, but the, a lot of the civil community. But this is a very historical moment because it's a very, as you see, it's like a neo-colonialism, pure neo-colonialism is the, um, a member of the Yagan community uh, giving her a letter that explain to them, to the royal couple, why they don't want salmon farms in their territory. Here you have 
David Alday, which will be one of the, our uh, in, uh, guests in another um, podcast conversation, um, giving the letter to the Royal Cup of, of Norway in Puerto Williams, in their territory. So this is a very, very symbolic moment um, that, uh, yeah, I mean, it has a lot of speculation around, but it's very clear, you know, it's, it's, it's very, very clear. She yeah. looks surprised. Yeah, yeah. And um, also it's interesting how your practice as an artist, researcher, that you have been collaborating with different scientists, but a certain moment when, when you engage with the Yagan community, you also start being a, a member somehow, and they requested to translate one open letter that circulated earlier. So, yeah. so you did the act of translation from Spanish into English, and I think that would be interesting if you share some some of this text because it illustrates like a, a moment and also the orality that we are looking in the text in the exhibition because not everything in fact is, is written so how to produce new references new statements new alliances and, and, and how to speak up yeah so my position as an artist has been it's not so easy to not repeat the same extractivist methods working with indigenous communities. So I guess the answer is uh, not imposing, but collaborating the reciprocity, understanding the real value of reciprocity. And that means also reciprocity in terms of the, uh, my own artistic process, opening, opening up to these communities and then let the communities, uh, uh, not let them, but inviting them to share their views and opinions and concepts to me. And, and for me, it, it's, it's a way to be able to help them for their resistance. So for instance, um, they did this open letter uh, July, July 2019, after the visit of the royal couple, uh, against the um, Nova Austral, one of the salmon farms Norwegian, with Norwegian capitals in Chile. Um, there was a, a, a legal process against them because there was a, a lot of um, dodgy, let's say, dodgy. Uh, circumstances around the, the legal installment of their, their uh, salmon farms. So they did an open letter and I offered them to translate so then we could share to other contexts, not only in Spanish, but also in English. And then I asked uh, uh, Gita Sertre, um, a colleague of mine, Norwegian artist, and then she translated into Norwegian. So they, they, then we could, uh, disseminate this letter in, in, into the Norwegian context. So that for me is part of the process to enable this own artistic project towards the, the benefit as uh, indigenous communities resisting this, um, this neo-colonization. Would you like to read some excerpt of the letter? Mm. It is very, very, a little bit harsh, but uh, yeah. The Yagan indigenous community, the residents of Puerto Williams of the defense of the territory in response of the information revealed by the newspaper El Mostrador regarding the practices of the salmon producer Nova Austral in its farming centers in Magallanes, we wish to express our absolute condemnation and rejection against this company and salmon farming in general, for their permanent, irresponsible, harmful, and corrupt, corrupt actions. The new known information is totally in line with the irregular and illegal procedures of the company in its attempt to settle in our territory, particularly on the Onashaga, the Beagle Channel. We have strongly and repeatedly reported this action in our struggle to reject 
to reject its installation in such a way that today several government institutions have agreed with us, declaring the expiration of the concessions they were seeking to operate. All their legal tricks, which they are still manipulating, are a mirror of the illegal activities that they always undertake in their farming centers. It is actually a permanent fraud in various aspects. In our seascape, considered an area of indigenous development, they did not perform the mandatory consult consultation. They falsified information and the documents to renew the concessions that never operated. They even falsified the declaration of environmental <clears throat> impact, also seeking to obtain an extension of the concessions. And then it goes on and on with the legal procedures. And this was all in the frame of COP25, which took place in, at the end in Spain, but it was organized by Chile, I don't know if you remember. Mm -hmm. And yeah, you, can, you, can, you will be able to read the letter in the exhibition, the whole letter in the exhibition. And the, during the, the research that, he, that we have been doing, also, uh, Alexandra Martin had been interesting uh, to map the geopolitical uh, unfortunate complicity through other cartographies that we that evidence the relation between the farm uh, salmon companies and the spread of the virus that yes. went from Norway also through Canada until and Chile. Chile. Yeah, yeah. She has been very important as, a, as far as I understand. I would love to meet her personally. But what I've known, and she, she has been recording the, um, recording the, the death of salmons, wild salmons in Canada, mainly due to a virus that has been spread because of the farm salmons there and a virus that came from Norway and right now has been spread to Chile as well. So in her studies and research, very, very important, she has been proved, proving that this uh, virus exists, first of all, and then the virus came from Norway to Canada and then uh, possibly through Canada or through and or through Norway spread to Chile as well. This is Morton's cartography of the virus. Actually, we don't know if it's Morton, but yeah, it's based on this the virus trajectory. Yeah. So um, this is one of the reasons why it's very attractive to me to go to Canada to to learn the complexities of this constellation around salmon, salmon farming and wild the protection of uh, wild salmon, and that is why in this case. This is representing Canada, this side, and uh, this seaweed is representing uh, a seaweed that I would love to put uh, in this side in the exhibition uh, by inviting the community to place or inviting someone who could place uh, a seaweed from British Columbia. So this is uh, a, a seaweed that I collected uh, in, in Magallanes, in Chile, but it's, um, it's actually could be a cousin or a sister seaweed from a seaweed that could, rep, uh, that could be present in the exhibition at our gallery. So this is the, the gesture I would like to uh, propose to get the connection with 
uh, with British Columbia and Canada without me being present there yet. So um, maybe we could talk about this. This is a new entity. Mm -hmm. Yeah, let's introduce this being. Mm -hmm. This is a peladilla. This animal is called, com is commonly called peladilla. This is a very small fish is uh, around 20 centimeters and uh, it's actually a group of fishes it's this uh, it's an species that is divided into three different species so it's commonly called peladilla but it's actually a group of three different species um, this is only one of the native animals that are in very vulnerable right now because uh, because of the salmons, the invasion of the salmons and the salmon escapees, the, the farm salmons, the farm salmon that escaped from the net in the south of Chile, and they they eat these little fish because they're smaller than them. Simple as that. They're smaller than them, and there are. Uh, in, this case, in the case of Peladilla, they belong to a group called, called Galaxidae. And Galaxidae are actually, from what I'm understanding scientifically, the opposite of salmon, because they are born in the river. And as soon as they are born, they go to the ocean, they grow up there, they almost the, the whole of their lives. And then, when when they are um, when 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 they are uh, they they need to reproduce themselves they go back to the river but actually in terms of seasons and timing they go against the 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 salmon and that's why they counter the salmon and they, the salmon eat them so that's why this is this is right now. Peladilla uh, is a vulnerable species. And um, this was my attempt to bring a representative entity from Chile into the exhibition, into this triangular constellation that um, for me is important to communicate, to make it visible. One of these species that is uh, actually vulnerable. Yeah, in some way is also resisting the farm salmon. So could be also be a friend, a fellow a being in the struggle against the farm salmon. Yeah. And uh, in, in your in your work, I find fascinating how research the documentary material, but also because not everything is documented, how you develop a strategies. Uh, towards the imaginary, so to uh, speculate as well, or what we can call the poetic. Mm. So you develop a virtual reality departing from a bone of uh, the being of the salmon, and also to humanize it and to try to imagine, uh, speculate together with a philosopher, a voice, a consciousness, a flow of consciousness. So I think it will be interesting to, to introduce one of the works that uh, our friends uh, in British Columbia in the Muslim territory will be able to visit, that is the, the bone, the virtual reality. Who was I? Was I alive? Was I sentient? Was I a feeling body at home inside the sensuous ocean world, this sound world, this water world? Perhaps you and I are both earth, thinking, 
and sensing and feeling itself inside each one of us. And who are they, my captive cousins? a very very delicate concept which is humanizing a species and this is something that i actually want to avoid mm -hmm. and this is the, the difficulty of this work because uh, i've been discussing this a lot with uh, people that have seen this this is virtual reality and but uh, mostly with uh, martin Le Müller, which is the author of this book that has been the backbone of this project and he uh, developed in this book which is actually his PhD thesis he's a German eco-philosopher based in Oslo and he's been going uh, many times to British Columbia so there's uh, some people there that might recognize him so we together we developed the script for the virtual reality the bone and in a way of not humanizing this species, but recognizing this species. Reco a rec an act of recognition from us as vertebrates, as the, descend the descendants of this species. So from, that, from this uh, philosophical standpoint, we develop this uh, Actually, there are two parallel stories. There's the story of the wild salmon and the story of the captive salmon, but uh, told from the perspective of the wild salmon trying to remember his life. And I say his life because as, as, as I said before, it was a male salmon that died in the 60s. So um, it was this salmon, it is this salmon con a flow of consciousness trying to remember how was his life from the day he, he was born in the river till the day he was died back to the same river after being in the ocean but also uh, asking himself how how are his cousins the captive sounds and then he is uh, in a way kind of like possessed by his cousins and tried to describe the contradictory life of the captive salmon in this plastic tank, eating the same pellets every day, uh, being confused and almost blind when they are transferred uh, from one second to the other to salt water and so on. So, um, yeah, this, this was a uh, this script was written together with Martin and uh, is very, very inspired by his book, Being Salon Being Human, which actually has the artwork of um, uh, an artist from British Columbia, April White. <laughs> So somehow when you did the dialogue uh, to, to write the script, you also enter in a, new, in a new debate. You have to somehow also challenge the very terms that were the departing point of, of uh, the book. Yeah. And I've had the honor to work with the author of this book. So... Yeah, I mean, the whole project has been a lot of collaborations, not only with them, but also with and the zombie, with the scientists, with different scientific uh, standpoints also. And this is what is interesting to me to, um, to dig and, and, and put in dialogue these different uh, uh, opinions within the scientific community and how they advocate uh, to the resistance against or against the salmon farming and in, in the protection of the uh, native species in the north and in the south. 
<coughs> sorry also how this uh, triangulation uh, bring us um, also to larger trajectories like we can remember in our own country when the farm salmons arrived but without having the knowledge that from where they were coming from they appear maybe on the table as kids uh, then as many young people, we would see them in the restaurant, the sushi, for example. Uh, and uh, without uh, uh, having any uh, education on, on the history of this uh, genetically modified, the, the farm salmon, neither the whole culture of, of uh, you know, what it means for many communities, the wild salmon. So somehow the the, the triangulation uh, becomes also a, a connection uh, to larger histories uh, without which we, we would not have this uh, cartography, this orientation to, to resist, to account, to unsettle, to question, uh, or to work with, mm -hmm. to take a position. Mm -hmm. So I think this uh, sometime artists, like uh, in your case, make further steps than the historians or the scientists or are able to make alliances uh, in order to, to bring these uh, cartographies that have not been uh, written uh, and uh, through speculation, through the imaginary, through the poetic, I see that one is able to take the risk and sometimes has to use words that are limited and, and then change them and vandalize them uh, in order to to, to really uh, try to depict and give a, a materiality and communication to, to the problem or to the story or to the characters, to the participants. So how, how is this um, poetic, the speculative or the imaginary, however we try to, 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 to call this energy that we try to, to give materiality, uh, give us a, into this complex story, uh, I think also I, uh, would be an opportunity now to tell how you dig in the in, in this speculation in the otolith that is this mm. this tiny part uh, of the salmon. You won't be able to really see, but uh, people who really know what an otolith is, they they know. But this is a this is a salmon, supermarket salmon otolith that I myself dipped in. Um, and the otolith for me is a very interesting discovery in while I was uh, working with the paleontologists. Actually, the first thing I, I started to do within the research of the, this, uh, this project. Otolith for me is a connection with my previous projects um, uh, researching into uh, saltpeter. Saltpeter is a crystal, it's a salt, it's a chemical compound that crystallizes, it's a, it's a, it's a crystal. So I'm very interested in the idea of a crystal as an archive, as a holder of information and, and uh, something that is also in the case of, especially in the case of uh, saltpeter, that is um, without temporality, without uh, place, because as a chemical compound, it has a, a very kind of like sacred geometry, the crystal. And that goes beyond temporalities, beyond the place where it comes from. And this, this sense of uh, atemporality is very interesting to me. And also the sense of uh, a crystal holding information, for example, the snow that is melting in, in, the, in the northern and southern poles, they're holding information about millions and millions and millions of years ago. Not only like probably all bacteria that doesn't exist anymore, but also viruses and uh, microorganisms. So this, sense, this idea of the crystal as a holder of information it's very interesting to me. So when I discovered this, the, the otoliths, the otoliths is not a bone, it's, it's called a biomineral by the scientists. The otolith is, is a biomineral. It's, it's also considered as a stone or a, a crystal that holds information 
and it's very important for the scientists to, in order to be able to study the life of a fish. So actually, we have otoliths as well. All the vertebrates have, have otoliths, and otoliths grow with uh, each season, in the case of the fish, holding biochemical information um, or uh, restructurization, let's say, uh, of um, minerals within this stone that reveal that scientists have been able to use this in order to uh, to know for example uh, which uh, which waters did they swim or how was the temper of the water what did they eat where did they go um, their own temperature and so on so this is kind of like a biochemical diary of this fish and this idea was also used in order to construct the narrative and the, the structure of the virtual reality. So there's, there's actually two otoliths floating in the middle of the skull. And once you activate them with your, with your eyes, they reveal voice in off of the, the stories I was telling you before. Yeah, and the otolith as archive and uh, storyteller, yeah. the activator. Mm -hmm. And then um, I think also uh, how we are confronting what uh, has been called the colonial library, that we know so much about the certain knowledges, mainly the Enlightenment, European, the hegemonic knowledge that are published, translated, and how we see here that uh, relevant knowledge also has to be uh, produced, that is not there to be consulted. So through orality, through collaborations of reciprocity, uh, through speculation also of mm -hmm. poetics, mm -hmm. we can uh, add certain files that maybe are not made of paper, could be oral experiences, uh, actions, uh, rituals, en encounters, mm -hmm. songs, um, also connections through virtual reality, dreams we were talking. Uh, uh, we could uh, contribute to enhance not only the files and the same uh, materiality of, of this limited uh, knowledge resource, this library, but also the experience. What is knowledge uh, based on what is important for us, what we want to know, and if it's not, not there, how we could uh, try to, to make it. And maybe this is uh, what make art is uh, for Michel Marie Leterrier and what is make culture for many practitioners and what is to make politics for activists, uh, scientists, artists, curators, authors, and so on. So I think we're, we're ready yes. to leave this conversation for now. Um, continue with other conversations with other guests um, coming from each one of the sides of these triangles and to kindly invite you to see the exhibition to experiment this exhibition and to trust this game because it's going to be like a game once you enter the exhibition thank you for for the conversation michel marie and for uh, being at your studio uh, this evening to Denise Reiner uh, at our gallery that uh, hosted us with all her warmth and professional, and spiritual and a friendly uh, spirit and to, and to the people that we will be engaging with very soon. Am I ancient or human-made machine? <laughs>